Welcome, everyone. Hello. If you could find your way to your seat and stand with us. We're going to begin in worship. Thank you so much for coming. We are so excited um, to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus. And yeah, if you could just join us for worship, that would be awesome. together and celebrate the babe in the manger, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is through Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection that reconciliation and relationship with God has been made possible. Tonight, tomorrow, and every day, let us meditate on and rejoice in the miracle that Jesus' birth is. If it's your first time here at New King, there are Connect cards behind all of the seats, and if you would want to fill the, one of those out, um, we can just get some info about who you are, and we can get you connected to our church. We would just love to get to know you um, and to see you get involved here at New King. Before we continue in worship, if you could just join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to come together and celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus. Lord, I just pray that um, you would renew us, Lord, with um, a fresh excitement about what that means, Lord. I think it's so easy to um, let that truth become dull, Lord, but it is such a miracle. It's the greatest miracle of all. The Word became flesh, Lord, and through Jesus' birth, we are able to have a relationship with the Lord. We are able to have eternal life, God. So I just pray tonight that um, you would reinvigorate us with a passion to live every day um, in honor, Lord, of what you have done for us, um, not only through your birth, but um, through your death on the cross and resurrection. Um, so we're just 
so thankful for the opportunity to even praise you tonight, God. Let every word that we say be for your glory and yours alone. Amen. Hello. Hey, everybody. Um, before we continue in worship, I'm going to re be reading one of the passages that we'll be going through tonight, and it's coming from John chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. After I read, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord. If you could respond by saying, thanks be to God. Beginning in verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. should have had this bookmarked. <laughs> All right, I am going to read from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of, of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. 
And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. This is the word of the Lord. All right, you can be seated. Merry Christmas. Despite my children's fears, it did finally get here. Um, would you pray with me, and then we'll, we'll get into the word together. Father in heaven, we are here to worship. We're here to stand in awe of what you've done. And to remember that at Christmas time, to remember the miracle of the incarnation that you sent your son, that the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. We're here to remember what that means for us, God, and we're here to worship you in response. And Father, I pray that you would speak that you would send your spirit now, that your word would go forth with power, that we would have ears to hear with, eyes to see with, things that are spiritual, spiritually understood, spiritually discerned. I pray, Lord, for those of of us in the room who are believers, that our hearts would be so, so strengthened and stirred up by grace, by the truth of the simple, beautiful gospel. God, I pray for those in the room that don't yet know you that the simple, beautiful gospel would be clear and grant life in your name, Lord Jesus. All to the end that you would be more glorified, that our lives would be more worshipful and that we would magnify you with everything that we do. This is all about you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we will look at uh, several different scriptures tonight, and we'll have them on the screen so that everybody can follow along. But my message will be a little shorter. We have our kids in here with us tonight, which is wonderful. Um, And uh, so you've got things to do. You've got Christmas Eve dinners to get to and things like that. So we'll We'll make this a little bit shorter than a typical sermon. Um, I think back on my my most memorable Christmases as a child, and I can remember certain gifts that stand out. For me, um, the Sega Genesis was one that really jumps out at me. Um, there was a bike that I really wanted that I can remember being so excited about. Um, there was a remote control car that I could not. It was it was a, called the Hijacker. And um, and this it it looked like kind of like a yeah this was a few years ago yeah um, it looked like a race car but you know you could press a button on the remote and pow the thing would pop up and you could take it off road I mean it was awesome um, and uh, and so I can remember those things right you probably have gifts that 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 are the most memorable for you when you look back and you know the idea of Gift giving has its origins in the Bible, the, the, the idea of gift giving on Christmas. Um, actually, Christmas is about God giving the greatest gift to mankind, 
that he's ever given, that, that, that could have been given. And that's what we're going to talk about, that's what we're going to think about tonight. We might be familiar with the verse in John 3.16 that says, For God so loved the world that he, what? Gave. That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. When, when we think about this, this moment, when we read the story from Luke 2, this moment when Jesus is born and, and he's laid in a manger and there's angels coming and announcing his birth and all of this that we're so familiar with, what, what I want you to think about this evening is that this was a gift, that this was, from heaven's perspective, God giving the greatest gift that had ever been given, that will ever be given. And we're going to talk about exactly why this was the greatest gift that could have been given. Um, first of all, though, we need to know something about God. Our God, it says in Isaiah chapter 6, is holy. Not just holy, though. He is holy, holy, holy. You see, in the ancient text, when a writer wanted to bring emphasis to something, he or she would repeat it. And so you'll see this technique many times. You'll, you might be familiar with it in Jesus' teachings. He might begin uh, his teaching with something like, Truly, truly, I say unto you. What he's doing there is he's, he's bringing emphasis to it. He is, he's wanting to say, that among the other things that I'm saying, I count this to be extraordinarily important. So when things are repeated in the ancient text, it's to show emphasis. It's to, it's to bring your attention to it. And among all of the wonderful attributes of God, the holiness of God, is the only attribute of God that is raised to the third degree, the superlative degree, that, that God, it is said, is holy, holy, holy. In fact, when we read Isaiah chapter 6, what we read is that there are seraphim, mighty, angelic beings that, that are that are flying around the throne that are continually crying out to one another holy 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 is the lord they're saying this back and forth and according to isaiah he says that when they say this the thresholds in the temple the heavenly temple the temple not built with human hands shake our god is holy what this means is it means that, that he is holy in all of his attributes. It, it means that he is perfect. It means that he is perfect in his integrity. He's perfect in his wisdom. He's perfect in his righteousness. He's perfect in his judgment. He's perfect in his power. It means that within God, there is no darkness at all. There is no sin at all. He is holy. He's perfect. He is righteous in all that he does. That is who God is. It says in Exodus 15, 11, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonders. And God is so holy that sin cannot be in his presence. And that brings us to our greatest problem. The Bible says that our greatest problem is sin. Our greatest problem is all our wrongdoing, our rebellion against God and his holiness. It says in the Bible that we are sinners because the first humans, Adam and Eve, sinned. When Adam sinned, what the Bible says is that sin was passed to all of humanity. It's, 
It's a word that theologians refer to as imputed. That sin was imputed to all of humanity through the one man, Adam. When he sinned, all sinned. It was imputed, counted to us. And so we're sinners because of it. And we're sinners because we practice sin. Everything that we do is tainted by sin and selfishness. The Bible says it this way in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. None is righteous. No, not one. So, so, so in our status, positionally, none of us is righteous. Not one. And then in practice, no one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. That's the bad news for us because God is holy, holy, holy. It's bad news that we are very far from that because He is righteous and we are unrighteous. That's our greatest problem. What we need then in order to be in a relationship with a holy God is we need righteousness. We need righteousness. Every other religion on the planet is about this, about trying to figure out a way, a system, a, 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 a list of works or a way, a religious duties of becoming righteous. This is innate in us. We all know it. We all long for it because, because deep down we know we've lost it. We, we've lost a righteousness that was originally to be ours at the fall. And so every religion has this idea that, that if you follow this path or this code or, this, or these rituals or you do these things, you can become righteous. And that appeals to us because, because we want it. And, and it. and it feels like we could do that. And we believe the lie that if, if we could just get our good deeds to you know, outweigh our bad deeds, then maybe one day when we stand before God, he would say that we would be acceptable. But Proverbs 14, 12 tells us this. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. And so it may seem right to us that we could do that, that we could follow a code, or we could be good enough, or we could, we could do enough to be counted righteous but that way will lead to death. That's the way that we think, not the way that's true, not the way that God thinks. Because here's what God says, Romans 3.20. says, for by works, by your deeds, by your activities, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. That we're justified. It means to be counted right, to be considered innocent. No one will be justified before God by works of the law, by their deeds. Not one person. And that brings us to the gift. It brings us to the gift. God offers us a gift. The dictionary defines a gift. As a thing given willingly to someone without payment. That's what a gift is. A gift is something that you have to give it willingly, and you can't receive payment for it in return. Those two things. If you pay for the thing, it's no longer a gift, right? If you give something in return for it, it's no longer a gift. It's a purchase. If you try to earn it, it's not a gift. Those are wages. If you earn it, it's a wage. You pay for it, it's a purchase. A gift is willingly given without anything given in return. Earlier I said that Christmas was all about the greatest gift ever given to us in the world. That God so loved the world that he gave his son. I just want us to consider what it was that God was giving us when he gave us his son. So our unrighteousness keeps us from being in the presence of God. That's our biggest problem. 
Righteousness is what we desperately need. And here's what I want us to see this evening. Wrapped up in the little baby, wrapped in swaddling cloths in a manger, wrapped up in that little baby was the greatest gift that God could have possibly given to humanity because what he gave in giving Jesus was righteousness. The gift of righteousness. Here's what we read in Romans 5, 17. For if because of one man's trespass, he's talking about Adam's sin, death reigned through that one man. Remember, sin was imputed to all of humanity because of Adam's sin. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of what? Righteousness. Reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. The gift that God gave in giving his only son to the world was the gift of righteousness. The gift of right standing in the presence of God. This is what he gave. And because it is a gift, you cannot earn it. Because it is a gift, you cannot buy it. You must simply receive it. Here's what we heard read in John 1, 11 through 12. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, he who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. A gift is offered, but it must be received. A gift is offered, and it cannot be earned. A gift is offered, and it cannot be paid for, and yet it must be received. How? But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, name we receive this gift of righteousness through faith it's the free gift and we cannot work for it listen to what romans 4 5 says to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly his faith is counted as righteousness to the one who doesn't work this is a gift offered to you to the one who knows you're ungodly this is the gift offered to you it is the gift of righteousness to those who don't work for it notice in this verse the word counted his faith is counted as righteousness that's the same word as imputed, counted, or credited. You don't do anything righteous, and yet you are counted as though you are through faith. You may feel in your, in your heart the, the flesh rising up against this claim. How could someone be counted as righteous having done nothing? If you feel that, you're actually getting what the gospel says. If you feel that little impulse in you, you're actually hearing it correctly. You do nothing to earn it. It is a gift imputed to you, counted to you, credited to your account. We must submit to this. You see, if we rise up against that internally and say, no, 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 there's something I need to do, there's something I've got to do, we'll miss the gift. Here's what Paul says a little bit later in Romans chapter 10 and verse 3. He says, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, talking about those of the Jewish faith, they did not submit 
to God's righteousness. Here's what Paul's saying. As long as you're seeking to establish your own righteousness by what you do, you are not submitting to God's righteousness. But as long as you recognize that you can't establish your own, you can't work to earn it, you can't do anything to be good enough for it to deserve it, then you're submitting to God's righteousness. So we don't seek to establish our own. We don't try to obey the law in order to be good enough. Look at what it says in Romans 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. When Christ came, he once and for all time put an end to the law for righteousness. You can't, you, it's impossible. No one will be justified by their keeping the law. No one. You will be justified by what? By faith. By believing. By receiving Christ through faith. And whose righteousness will will you receive listen to romans 3 21 through 22 now the righteousness of god the righteousness of god has been manifested apart from the law although the law and the prophets bear witness to it the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ for all who believe do you hear what this is saying What this is saying is that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are credited with the righteousness of the holy, holy, holy God. You are credited with perfect righteousness. That's got to feel good to some people in here. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You are credited with the righteousness of a perfectly holy God. The righteousness of Christ, who is the holy, holy, holy God. This is the good news that the angels came singing about on Christmas. That God's righteousness through faith in Jesus is imputed to us. One more verse I want to look at to help us feel this the way that we ought to feel it. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake, He, God, made Him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. What is he saying? When Jesus died on the cross, when he hung on the cross, it says he became sin. He made him to be sin. How? Not by sinning. He did not ever sin. He did no sin he knew no sin and yet he was counted as our sin it was imputed to him transferred onto him so that what so that in him we might become the righteousness of god how not by doing righteousness no while we were still his enemies. While we are the furthest thing from righteous, while we are still ungodly, he does what? He imputes the righteousness of God on to us. 
just as he imputed our sin onto Christ, while Christ never sinned, he imputes the righteousness of Christ onto us while we have never done righteousness. It is the great exchange. We give him our sin. We give him our filth. We give him our brokenness. We give him our rebellion. We give him all of that and he in exchange gives us the very righteousness of God credited to our account. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin, what we've earned with our sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In Jesus, even as he lay there in a manger, in him was a gift being offered to the world. He would grow up and live a sinless life. He would fully obey his Father's will, fully obey the law. And then he would go to the cross becoming our sin on the cross, our sin imputed to him. He would pay the price for it, die, be buried, raised from the grave on the third day so that all who believe in him could have his perfect righteousness credited to them. Is that not good news? And so when we celebrate Christmas this year, This is what we're celebrating, that he would count sinners totally righteous as a free gift. If you've never received this free gift, I want to invite you this evening to turn to him and believe. Give him your sin. Give him your rebellion. Give him your filth and let him give you his perfect righteousness. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the gospel, for its beauty and its simplicity. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. By giving us Jesus, you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. Help us to believe it. Help us to see it, God. Help us who have seen it to respond in worship, to give our lives, to give our words to give all that we do to you in response in worship. Be pleased with our worship tonight, God. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey everyone, Merry Christmas. It's so great to be here. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at New King, and that guy was Ben. If you haven't met us, please say hello before you go. We're so happy you're here tonight. And uh, I just want to say thank you to the worship team. You guys did a great job. You worked hard, and you really led us in worship. So thank you very much for that. So I want to just briefly uh, tell you what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, and how to do it, right? Because we're going to be touching fire. We're going to have fire in our hands, right? So we're going to have a, a little candlelight time here where we light candles. Why do we do that? What, what is up with that? Why do we do that? Let me just tell you briefly, John's gospel is really interesting. Frankie, help me now. What's going on? Okay. I, I keep hearing a little echo. That's okay? All right. So um, why do we do it? John's gospel, if you read John's gospel, seven times Jesus says, I am. Seven times he says, I am. Like in the sixth chapter, he says, I am the bread of life. In the tenth chapter, he says, I am the good shepherd. I give my life for the sheep. In the eleventh chapter, I am the resurrection and the life. But in the eighth chapter, in the eighth chapter, he says, I am the light of the world. And you that follow me, will not walk in darkness, but will walk in light. So we light candles on Christmas Eve to testify that Jesus is the light of the world, that he has illuminated our life, and as we go out into the dark world, we carry the light of Jesus with us. That's why we do it. Now, how to do it? So I used to preach in a church that was built in the early 1800s. Preached there for a while, and I was always afraid that the place was going to go up, right? That someone's hair was going to get on fire. They'd go screaming, running out, light the place on fire. It'd be all over the news. It'd burn the ground. So here's what you do to prevent that, right? What, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start. I'm going to light a couple on each side. When you turn to your neighbor with your lit candle, you don't turn it like that. You hold it upright, right, away from your body, and they'll bring their candle in, and they'll light it. And what's going to happen is the lights are going to go back. As it moves through, Frank is going to dim the lights, and we're going to start to sing. Okay? You with me? You good? Okay.
You may be seated. Uh, just a couple announcements, and then I'll pray for you to go. Two things. Um, if you are new here and you'd like to know more about New King, please fill out a Connect card and just drop it in the bowl as you leave. If you want to know more about us and would like to connect with us, we'd love to connect with you. Secondly, on uh, Sunday, we will only have one service at 9.15. So Sunday, just the first service, 9.15. So let me pray a blessing on you as we go. Let's pray. Father God, I ask that you would bless this congregation tonight, that you would bless each person in the name of Jesus, that we would go from this place with the name of Jesus on our lips, with the light of Jesus in our hearts, with the gift of righteousness <laughs> applied to our souls. Father, I pray that you would just give us peace, your shalom, as we leave this place. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Have a Merry Christmas. Go in peace.